Thank you for joining us for the Laurier Association for Lifelong Learning at Home series presented by the Laurier Association for Lifelong Learning. For over 20 years, the Laurier Association for Lifelong Learning has been offering unique adult learning opportunities on Laurier's Waterloo and Brantford campuses. Our non-credit courses are intended for personal interest and self-education. We're pleased to offer you this opportunity to learn from your own home and are excited to be joined today by Amy Milne-Smith. Amy Milne Smith is an associate professor of history who teaches British and Imperial history at Laurier. She has previously led seminars with the Laurier Association for Lifelong Learning on Victorian Whitechapel and mental illness. She researches men and mental illness in Victorian Britain and British military and wrote a book entitled London Clubland, a cultural history of gender and class in late Victorian Britain. Thank you for joining us today, Amy. We'll now turn it over to you for your lecture Passion, Poison, and Betrayal, Murder at the Priory. Thank you, everyone. Um, hello and virtually welcome. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a good old-fashioned Victorian murder mystery. Um, it's the stuff of legend and makes for a pretty captivating and cinematic story, but it is also about something that really happened. Uh, it's about a desperately unhappy woman who was either driven to murder or was suspected of murder until the end of her life. It's a story uh, that shows how the constraints of Victorian society could lead to some pretty devastating side effects. That the class and gendered expectations could lead to spectacular breakdowns and failures. And while I don't think we're going to get to the uh, heart of the whodunit, sorry about that, uh, I do think we'll get a good picture of the problems that were often right below the surface of these kind of sedate photographs we're so used to seeing of the 19th century. One of the underlying themes of my teaching career has always been that the Victorians are a lot more scandalous than you think, and we're certainly going to see that today. But let's start at the end, or at the beginning of the end, as it were. So on the night of August the 18th, 1876, the Bravo household dined as usual at the Priory, their home, very grand home in the respectable southwest suburb of London. Later that night, Charles Bravo began vomiting and shouting out that he had been poisoned. Three days later, he was dead from a fatal dose of tartar emetic. Charles Bravo was poisoned, but the resulting mystery forever poisoned the lives of everybody who survived and everybody became implicated in his death. It's a mystery that has baffled people for over a century. And you can see from the title here, if you're wondering, Agatha Christie herself was fascinated by the murder. It's mentioned in this book of hers, Ordeals by Innocence, as an unsolved murder that threw permanent shades of suspicion on everyone involved. Julian Fellows of Downton Abbey fame posted a series called A Most Mysterious Murder. And you can see a screenshot here. The first episode was about the case of Charles Bravo starring a young Michael Fassbender. It was the case of Charles Bravo, an absolute cause celebre of the time. Here is an image from the newspaper outlining all of the people who were at the inquest and naming them below. During the inquest, the news reports eclipsed government and international news as the headline story across the nation and beyond. I think firstly, because it was a murder mystery. And secondly, because the investigation really pulled back the curtain of a wealthy Victorian marriage to find scandal and resentment and betrayal on all sides. Because the real drama of the Bravo story wasn't about Charles really. As we will see, he's kind of a one dimensional cad, but it's the fascinating story of his wife, Florence. Florence, named Florence Campbell when she was born in 1845, was the second of seven children. Uh, she was born into a wealthy family. Her father had made a fortune in Australia. Her childhood was idyllic by almost anyone's standards. She was surrounded by servants. They had holidays abroad. She was her father's favorite child by all accounts and he spoiled her pretty well. Florence grew up, grew up and was considered to be a great beauty in her time. She had a mix of independence and fragility that Victorians most loved in their women. 
And at the age of 19, while on a trip to Canada, she met a man named Alexander Ricardo, where she, he was stationed over there with the Grenadier Guards, a very dashing unit of the British military. Apparently, they had the best uniforms. He was tall and dark and handsome, and she saw him across a proverbial crowded room at a party. They were introduced, they danced together, they spoke together on a dark balcony. It was love at first sight. Ricardo was also an appropriate match. He was the son of a liberal MP. He's, his father had founded the International Telegraph Company. His mother was sister to the Duke of Fife, so well-connected, wealthy. It was a match made in heaven. And no surprise, they were married very quickly. That was not unusual at the time. Her father settled a thousand pounds a year on her, not inconsiderable sum at the time. But there is an old saying that holds true in this case, marry in haste, repent in leisure. And that was certainly true for Florence. Because after they got married, they had to sort out the details of life together. Florence didn't want to be an army wife. And as it turned out, Alexander wasn't a particularly good civilian. He tried to go into business with his father, but that didn't work out. So then he tried working for Florence's father. That didn't really work out either. He seemed to just kind of lose interest in whatever he was supposed to be doing. And that gave him a lot of time. He was wealthy, he was privileged, he didn't necessarily have to work. So he spent most of his free time carousing, great Victorian type of term, drinking quite heavily. And there were rumors of other women. Florence quickly discovered that she was married to a full-blown alcoholic who became verbally abusive after a few drinks, accusing him, uh, her of trapping him into marriage, of ruining his life. After six years of this, Ricardo was known to be rarely sober. She spent as little time as possible at home with him. And matters finally came to a head one night at Christmas when Florence chastised her husband. He'd been drunkenly insulting her sister and she asked him to stop. Ricardo struck her three times in the face. She was shocked and fled to her parents' home, pouring out the story of what had happened and asking if she could live with them. Despite being her father's favorite, she was shocked, almost more shocked by the reception she got at her parents' house than she was by her husband's behavior. Domestic violence was unfortunately quite common in the 19th century, but she led a sheltered existence before her marriage in a very happy home. Domestic violence tended to be something wealthy people thought happening in working class homes where it was more publicized. There would be court cases reported in the newspapers. Um, but when Florence went to her family and told them what had happened, her father's reaction really did surprise her. He was disappointed, certainly in his son-in-law's violence, but he was appalled at the idea of separation. And he found the idea that she would want to separate from her husband morally repugnant. Florence had married Ricardo and it was up to her to make the marriage work no matter what. He insisted she return to her husband. Florence, though, had been raised a young woman with a fair amount of independence, and she refused. You might wonder at her father's position at the time, but it was pretty consistent with thinking. Women were not solo actors under the law. They were essentially dependents, first to their father and then to their husbands. You might ask then, well, did she try to get a divorce? Well, she could have. Um, you could get divorced in England, going, well, all the way back to Henry VIII, remember, the whole divorce, beheaded, died deal? But divorce was incredibly rare, unless you were the King of England. It was expensive and it was complex. It was overseen by the ecclesiastical court of arches and the canon law of the Church of England, until, that is, 1857. The Matrimonial Causes Act reformed divorce law and made it slightly more accessible and affordable. It abolished that old ecclesiastical jurisdiction and basically made a divorce a secular act. They took the church out of it. The act created a new court, the Court of Divorce and Matrimonial Causes, uh, and they basically decided civil divorce. 
The act allowed legal separation by either husband or wife on the grounds of adultery, cruelty, desertion, but it did not see these things equally. A husband could petition for a divorce on the sole grounds that his wife had committed adultery, whereas a wife could only hope for a divorce based on adultery, remember those other women Ricardo had, combined with other offenses such as incest or cruelty or bigamy or desertion. Why? Well, the grounds were that women's adultery was more serious than men's adultery because it introduced doubt as to potential paternity. The law was also based on the understanding that women were kind of asexual and men were sexually voracious. So for a woman to have an extramarital affair was seen as much worse, not just because of potential heirs not being the fathers, but it was seen as against her nature, whereas men were seen as having a nature that tended to stray. This law, when it was introduced, didn't dramatically increase divorce. There were about 200 to 300 cases a year out of 170,000 marriages every year. There were reasons for this. First of all, the double standard of how to get the divorce. And secondly, it wouldn't have really helped Florence. Maybe she could have gotten it on the grounds of she would have had to prove his adultery and his violence towards her would have had to have been deemed cruelty. Not clear either of those would have been easy. But more importantly, she would have been left with nothing had she gotten a divorce because she was married before the Married Women's Property Act came into effect. She fit in this loophole when divorce was allowed, but women's property wasn't protected. Any money made by a married woman, her wages, her investments, her savings accounts, gifts, inheritance, if she was a writer and she made income, that was all her husband's legal property until 1870. Married women were not recognized as being separate legal beings. When Florence married Ricardo, she gave away any property rights she had, but frankly, she didn't have any to begin with because they were her father's before that. And knowing her father's opinion about divorce, had she separated from Ricardo, she would have been left penniless. Her mother stepped in with a compromise between these two unacceptable options, either go back to your husband or divorce and become penniless. So she said, why don't you, Florence, go away to the Hydra? It's a fashionable sanatorium that was run by a family friend of theirs, uh, James Gully. Once she went there, had a time to relax, a time to gather her nerves, maybe Ricardo would have a chance to get himself together. Hopefully they could reconcile and make amends after that. Hydro at Great Malvern was run by Dr. James Gully. He was 63 at the time, and he was well known for practicing the water cure, or what was known as hydrotherapy. He founded the clinic where a lot of famous Victorians stayed, including Charles Darwin and Alfred Lord Tennyson. Gully surprised Florence when she got there, though, because for the first time, she found a truly sympathetic ear, someone who was sympathetic to her point of view. He took her side on the view of separation from her husband. In fact, he actually went one better and offered to help her close that gap uh, of the law where she had no rights. Basically, he ended up becoming her legal guardian, stepping in where her father wasn't willing to do. He instructed his lawyers to have papers drawn up, including an annual alimony payment for Florence, and he offered to allow her to stay at the Hydro for free. What they were setting up here was that she could legally separate from her husband without actually divorcing him. Now, Ricardo heard about this news and flooded Florence with letters, trying to plead his case, trying to get that separation his mother had hoped for. Florence refused to either see Ricardo or read the letters or telegrams that he sent. She was done with him. Florence didn't want to leave Malvern, and more particularly over time, it became clear she did not want to leave Gully because she was absolutely infatuated with him. Gully arranged for her to rent a house in Malvern, so leaving the hydrotherapy center and just renting her own little home. 
They spent increasing amounts of time together. He invited her to join him on a trip to Kissingen in Bavaria. You can see a photo of that here. And on vacation, they became lovers. Gully was unlike anyone she'd met before. He treated her very differently than her husband or her father had treated her. Most Victorians believed women were essentially virginal, frail creatures who needed to be protected from the world. Gully thought that in fact, society's pressure on women to be these perfect, passionless, virtuous creatures was at the root of a lot of their problems in society and led to a lot of these kind of vague neurological complaints that he treated at the hydro. He's very ahead of his time here. But unfortunately, not only was Florence married already, so was Gully. Gully was married to an older woman that he'd been separated from for some time, but she'd gone insane and you actually couldn't get a divorce from somebody who was insane. So he was trapped in a marriage until his wife passed away or regained her senses. So Florence at 26 fell under the spell of this kindly man who seemed to provide the care and attention she never received from her husband. Gully also understood that women had sexual needs and he took care to make sure Florence had pleasures in bed. And we, this is one of those rare cases where we actually find out a little bit about the sex lives of Victorians. In April of 1871, Florence learned that she was actually a widow. Uh, Ricardo had died in a hotel room from drink. He was never able to pull himself together. Since he never changed his will, Florence inherited his entire estate to the tune of 40,000 pounds. Not only was she now free, she was a wealthy woman in her own right. A widow in the 19th century had the most power that a woman could have in the 19th century, more than a daughter, more than a wife. She left Malvern and moved to London and convinced Gully to join her there. This wasn't just a love affair anymore. They actually were secretly engaged, waiting for the day when Gully's wife would die. I mean, he, she was in her 70s. Everyone was kind of waiting for it. And they had a secret engagement uh, waiting until they could marry and consolidate their union. He bought his own house about five minute walk from Florence's. Florence bought herself a mansion, you can see it here, known as the Priory, uh, the name of the lecture. And soon after she hired a companion for herself, a woman named James Cox. That's what wealthy people did at the time. Jane Cox had worked as a nanny, uh, for a curate and a solicitor where she interviewed with Florence to be a companion, somewhere in between a friend and a paid servant. The two women did become friends and Cox began to look on Florence as kind of the daughter she'd never had. Soon after Florence and Gully moved to Balham, their passion for each other led them to make an incredibly serious mistake. They were staying with her solicitor her solicitor and his wife in Surrey, in separate bedrooms, of course. Florence and Gully, though, were caught by the solicitor and his wife in flagrante delecto on the couch after they came home early from a walk. The solicitor and his wife were absolutely horrified by this. They were appalled, not just that the two were having an adulterous affair, but they'd been so crass as to abuse their hospitality by openly fornicating on their sofa. And as you might imagine, gossip about the affair spread like wildfire after that, not just from the solicitor and his wife, who probably wanted to keep it quiet because they would also be embarrassed by this, but the servants found out and the servant grapevine in the 19th century was intense. Soon everybody knew about the relationship. Now, Gully was a married man, but having an affair was perhaps not that surprising given his circumstances and had it been kept quiet, it would not have been too scandalous. Except for the fact that this wasn't a normal affair. Florence had been his patient. He had been her guardian, legal guardian, and he'd broken some pretty important boundaries there. Florence's parents soon heard and they were shocked 
that their daughter would have an adulterous affair with a man old enough to be her father, if not almost grandfather. It was just beyond the pale for them that either would have done this and they cut their daughter off completely. They had no contact with her. They were emblematic of society's reaction in general. Society shunned the two of them, but they continued for a little while. It only ended when Florence accidentally became pregnant while on holiday with Gully in Austria. They had been using Victorian forms of birth control, but they were not particularly effective. And what happened when she became pregnant was an absolute disaster. An illegitimate child would have ruined Florence permanently and damaged Gully's reputation further. They'd been hoping to this point his wife would die, they would marry, and that would kind of legitimate their union. They saw themselves as having no alternative but for Gully to perform an abortion on Florence, which he reluctantly did. And there were complications during this procedure and Florence almost died. From that moment, the relationship changed and became platonic. Though Gully was still clearly in love with Florence, I think she just felt she'd paid too high a price and it wasn't worth it anymore. Jane Cox nursed Florence through her illness after the abortion, keeping the truth from the servants. And while Florence recovered, Jane could see that the social ostracism was really trying to get to her. She started encouraging Florence to look for a new husband, to try to get a second chance to rehabilitate her reputation. Enter Charles Bravo. On the surface, Charles seemed like the perfect man to fit this bill. He was witty, he was charming, he had this kind of wry wit. He was a barrister, an appropriate profession. He had a zest for life. He could talk knowledgeably about politics and literature. He was considered quite attractive. He was the same age as Florence. And he was ambitious. He wanted to stand for parliament eventually, but given his position, he was only making about 200 pounds a year and he didn't come from a family that was giving him a lot of money. Florence was wealthy and the match would have made sense. Back home, they began to spend a lot of time together. When they were apart, they kept a steady correspondence and soon Charles proposed marriage. The only sticking point, of course, was Dr. Gully. While they were now just friends, Florence would have to break things off entirely with Gully now. And she felt she needed to confess the affair to Bravo. He'd heard rumors, but she wanted to be upfront with him, to not be accused of trapping someone into a marriage. Now, Jane Cox was a woman of the world. She tried to warn Florence about this that you might be ruining your chances with Bravo or he might not look at you the same way again. But to her great surprise, Bravo took the news with ease. He confessed he was not blameless and in fact had a mistress of his own and a child. And they both agreed they would break off their liaisons and never mention them again. Florence basically sent Gully a Dear John letter. When he heard the news, Gully tried to reach out to Florence, advising her to take her time and not rush into anything, get to know Charles and his family properly. But the wedding was set for December 14th, 1875. Gully was upset, even more so when she said, not only do I not wanna have contact with you, you really should move. Remember, five minute walk away. Gully, at this point, dug his heels in, refused to move, and just cut off communications with Florence. He was mad now, too. But Florence, if you wonder why would she take this step, she realized that it was her only way back to society. If a respectable husband accepted her, it would take a lot of the stigma off of her. Not all of it, but a lot. There were problems, though. The first signs of trouble came during the engagement over money. Bravo was enraged that Florence planned to keep her fortune in her name, which was now her right because now the Married Women's Property Act had been passed, which allowed women to own property. And Charles did not have any property. 
Charles, in fact, had debts of over 500 pounds in his names, a huge sum at the time for a man making only 200 pounds a year. He, though, was frustrated and irate at the power imbalance he felt this money situation would bring. He was recorded as saying, I quote, cannot contemplate a marriage which doesn't make me master in my own house. The wedding plans almost fell apart at this point because Florence didn't want to give up her fortune. She didn't want to put herself in the situation she'd been in before. She learned her lesson. But Charles Bravo saw it as emasculating to be kind of a kept man in the household. Florence, going back to old sources of comfort, actually reached out to Dr. Gully again for his advice. And he had some sensible advice. He said, make a compromise, write over the house in Bravo's name. So Bravo would own the priory, priory, but you would still have all of your funds that you inherited after your husband's death. This seemed an agreeable compromise. Now, you might wonder, why would these two enter into a marriage that had so many red flags? Why, after suspecting Bravo was after her money, would Florence go through with it? I mean, it's simple. Marriage to Bravo would give her back the veneer of respectability that she so craved. Some also speculated that Charles might have gotten Florence pregnant before the wedding. It came out uh, that Charles who had been known to spend nights at the Priory before they were married. Florence herself told the inquest that her his mother worried about him catching a chill in the night air if he returned home. But of course, he slept in a guest room. That's how she explained the sleepovers. Realistically, though, it would have been a pretty simple matter for Bravo to demand, to demand his marital rights beforehand. So it could be that a pregnancy forced the union together, but really they both got something out of this marriage. Charles got money, Florence got respectability. And after a short honeymoon in Brighton, the newlyweds returned to the Priory and society began to open its doors. It worked. She threw a party at Christmas for 30 guests, including the mayor of a nearby town. And for a brief moment, it seemed to be working. As the quotation here says, this is Florence recollecting, the happiest time of my life. But it was short-lived. Bravo received several anonymous letters after his marriage accusing him of marrying Florence for her money. He immediately suspected Dr. Gully of being the culprit. Far from restraining to ever mention his name, remember they'd made an agreement to never mention their paramours' names, it now appeared Bravo became kind of obsessed with Gully. And unfortunately, he proved he was a model Victorian husband in all the worst kind of ways. He expected total obedience from Florence in all things. After all, he was the man and she was just a woman. This was a complete reversal of the relationship that she'd enjoyed so much with Gully, who'd seen her more as an equal. But by this point in her life, Florence was not going to be meek and submissive just because it was expected. And frankly, she'd never been very good at that. Bravo told Florence things had to change at the Priory. She was living too extravagantly. He insisted that she dismiss her personal maid. Uh, he wanted her to fire some gardeners, get rid of her horses. Florence refused and that only increased his rage because in effect, she was holding the purse strings. So he could suggest these things, but he couldn't enforce them. Apparently these fights would continue. He would threaten to leave her. He would storm out of the house, but it was an impasse because he had no power to control the money. The only place that Bravo did have complete control over Florence was in the bedroom. Uh, apparently at the inquest, it came out that he used to like to require her to submit to his sexual advances, whether she wanted to or not. So he would demand sex whenever he wanted it. He also started to force her to engage in sexual acts that she found degrading. Uh, for example, sodomy. Florence was soon pregnant, but she fled to her parents because 
she was worried about what might happen to the child. Um, but her parents, no surprise, sent her back home to her husband. Charles, like Alexander, had been sending her letters pleading for her to return, but he wouldn't admit he was wrong. He just asked her to come home and things will be better. Shortly after her return from her parents, though, Florence miscarried. And things just went from bad to worse. Bravo hit her for the first time when Florence said she was planning a trip to Worthing to recover after her miscarriage. He also then insisted they try again for another baby only three weeks after she lost the child. Florence was afraid of this. She doubted she could ch carry a child to term at this point. And if she did, she worried it might kill her. She'd had a lot of kind of vague health complaints even before this miscarriage. Two weeks after they started having sex again, she was pregnant again. This pregnancy though, as she had feared, didn't last long either. Less than a month later, she miscarried working in the garden. Soon after she discovered she was pregnant, Bravo was actually struck down briefly by a mysterious illness of his own. One day on his way to work in London, he was hit by waves of nausea, was violently ill, but apparently recovered within 24 hours. To say things were tense in 1876 in their marriage was an understatement. Physical assault by men on their wives and children was not that uncommon, though the tolerance for abuse was decreasing over the course of the 19th century. The issue of controlling male violence and particular violence against women was seen as kind of key to Victorians, the need to protect women from men. The act for the betterment, the better prevention of aggravated assault upon women and children was passed in 1853 that first defined how much chastisement a husband or father could actually use. It allowed magistrates to punish attacks uh, that resulted in any bodily harm for up to six months in prison with hard labor. And it seemed every decade there were new pieces of legislation trying to better enforce laws against domestic violence to protect women, but also to reform men. And I think this quotation here is quite telling. An MP on debating another bill said that violence against women should be punishable by flogging, according to this bill. And he said the problem of violence against women had nothing to do with women's behavior. This is a pretty novel idea. But in fact, it's about concerning the character of our own sex, he said, that we should repress these unmanly assaults. And he believed that upon the men who committed them, they had a worse and more injurious effect than they had on the, minute, the women who endured them. But a lot of women didn't seek out these legal aids, even when it was available. And in the case of Florence, it's maybe not surprising she didn't sh seek out legal aid because of the publicity involved. Domestic violence rarely reached the courts unless the woman sustained serious injury or hospitalization. Florence had already seen her fair share of scandal and she knew any new scandal would likely find herself blamed as much as her husband despite what this MP said. She was worried she would be blamed. But it is important to note this in terms of the backstory. When they decide on what happened to Charles Bravo, his character does come into play as well. On April the 18th, 1876, uh, Charles Bravo went out for a day of riding. He returned home so badly shaken, he had to be helped into a chair. His horse had been spooked by something and had run away with him. He wasn't injured, but he was severely rattled. And then during dinner, it was not his night. He received a letter from his stepfather, furious because he discovered that Bravo had been gambling on the stock market. Florence later said, quote, his face worked the whole of dinner. And he had such a strange yellow look. I thought he would go mad at any moment. His mood did not improve during dinner. He at one point accused Florence of having too much to dr drink because she asked her maid to bring her a glass of wine before bed, calling her a drunken harlot. It was not a good, good night. <laughs> 
But luckily he went to bed soon after that. They had separate bedrooms. Um, and Florence insisted that Jane spend the night with her that night. She still was recovering from her last miscarriage. So Charles went to bed, but a few minutes later, he opened his door and cried out for hot water. The maid heard his cry and came to see what was the matter. Bravo's face was hot and sweaty and he shrieked for hot water. He opened the window and threw up onto the roof. As soon as she was told about Bravo's illness, Mrs. Cox rushed into action. She called for coffee and mustard in the hopes of bringing up whatever was making him sick. Bravo threw up again, this time into a basin, which Cox gave to a servant to wash out. She then sent for Florence's personal physician, though he lived across town, so it would take a while for him to get there. Now, Florence was awakened by all the commotion. She ordered a servant to go and get a nearby doctor as they couldn't wait for her personal physician. By this point, Charles Bravo had actually lost consciousness. Both doctors, when they each arrived, came to the same diagnosis that Bravo had been poisoned by what they had no idea and the patient wasn't in any shape to tell them. Florence suggested they call Bravo's cousin, who was also a doctor, to come see. He arrived and brought another doctor with him. The house was lousy with doctors at this point. And he did wake up. Charles woke and was questioned about what had happened, what made him ill. Charles said that he had taken some laudanum for a toothache as uh, a pain reliever. This was quite common, but what you did is you rinsed it around in your mouth and, and spit it out. And he said, maybe I swallowed some by mistake, but that didn't fit his symptoms. They didn't suggest a laudanum overdose. This is when Mrs. Cox pulled the doctors aside and told them, bravo, when she first went into the room, revealed to her that, quote, I've taken some of that poison, don't tell Florence. Mrs. Cox said he didn't uh, say what kind of poison he'd taken, but they admitted to taking a poison. The next afternoon, Bravo managed to make out a will. He left everything to Florence, despite their quarrels. Doctors questioned him again, but he stuck to his story. He took laudanum and only laudanum. He didn't know what was going on. The morning of the third day, Dr. Johnson took some fresh vomit with him for an analysis, but they couldn't find anything. They didn't know what had poisoned him. Um, but things were not going well. And finally, Sir William Gull, I know Gull and Gull gets confusing. Uh, it, this guy was Queen Victoria's personal physician was called to the case after being sent by Florence. He was blunt and to the point. Bravo was dying. He needed to tell them what happened. And if he didn't speak out, someone might be accused of poisoning him. But again, he said the same story he always had. And on the morning of Friday, April 21st, at 5.30 in the morning, he died. Because of the cause of death being suspicious, an inquest was uh, immediately opened. The police were pretty ill-equipped to deal with a crime of this nature. In fact, it took them eight days after Bravo's death to question Florence and Mrs. Cox. This crime involved, involved the upper classes. Most of the police were not used to dealing with their betters, as it were. And the upper classes weren't used to being questioned by lower class policemen. Florence's father had been a justice of the peace, a high sheriff, and he dismissed any police inquiries by boasting he'd get a verdict of suicide in five minutes. An autopsy showed Charles had been poisoned by tartar emetic, made from antimony, which was a very harsh poison. But how could someone slip this to him? After further research, it was found Charles had been in the habit of drinking water before bed, and it could be dissolved in water. An inquest was held at the Priory after Florence offered it as a venue. So the inquiry into Bravo's death happened in Florence's home. No press was notified and Florence was never called as a witness. In fact, she served refreshments to the inquest and it was returned as an open verdict, basically, that they didn't know what had happened, that he might have committed suicide, but there wasn't enough evidence to show what had happened. 
Myth, though, satisfied no one outside of Florence's family. His family protected, in particular, Bravo's family. His stepfather went to the trouble of hiring his own private Scotland Yard investigator. It soon came out that there was a man called George Griffiths, a groom at the Priory, who'd been fired soon after George, uh, Charles and Florence were married. He was fired and witnesses overheard him being uh, telling anyone who would listen that Bravo wouldn't live out for months. He was one of the first witnesses they called. He confessed that yes, he had said that, but that's because he'd seen Bravo get bitten by a dog and he thought he was rabid. Soon came out, in fact, that the only reason he'd come forward was to collect the 500 pound reward for evidence in the case. So that kind of fell apart pretty quickly. Um, the next, uh, the next kind of suspicion fell on Jane Cox or Florence Bravo. The details of the second inquest were considered so scandalous, women and children were banned from the room while Florence uh, Bravo testified. The second inquest happened in a public space, not Florence's home. The reason suspicion first turned to the women was the method of death. If it was a poisoning, women were the natural suspects. Uh, it long had a reputation poison of being a woman's weapon. Outside of the hotel where the second inquest was happening, crowds swelled in the hot summer air, trying to get a glimpse. Florence detailed Charles's meanness. She admitted to her relationship with Gully for the first time. She was repeatedly questioned about minute details of what had happened. It's the reason we know so much about their affair is because she was forced to give testimony on the stand. At one point, she demanded the coroner protect her from the intrusive questions asked by Bravo's solicitor. I refuse to answer any more questions about Dr. Gully. This inquiry is about the death of my husband, and I appeal to the jury as men and as Britons to protect me. Gully also had to take his turn on the stand. He found the questions a bit intrusive as well, but he couldn't use the same excuses as Florence. He couldn't exactly ask the men to defend his honor. Instead, he repeated several times, I don't see the relevance of these questions. During the inquest, it was revealed that Dr. Gully and Mrs. Cox had been in contact with each other before Bravo's death. Cox explained they'd met in a train station in London by accident. And then in the next several weeks, they were seen together in public a total of five times. Cox explained she asked Gully to prescribe a medicine for Florence who was having trouble sleeping. Gully agreed and suggested he leave her at, at uh, Mrs. Cox's house in Notting Hill for her to pick up so that he wouldn't have to go by the Priory. One of her tenants signed for it. He noticed the bottle had a small poison label on it. But according to Mrs. Cox, Florence never even received this medicine um, because when the came, time came to produce the bottle, Mrs. Cox said, the, well, I threw it out because Florence didn't need the medicine after all. Jane Cox did alter some of her testimony a little bit though. She said that Bravo had told her, I have taken poison for Gully, don't tell Florence hinting that Bravo's motive for committing suicide was jealousy for Gully. So she tried to lay out a very clear counter narrative that this wasn't a poisoning, that it wasn't an accident, and that in fact he had in a fit of passion taken poison out of jealousy. The inquest took 32 days and there was a lot of testimony, a lot of evidence, but none of it was really conclusive and in fact, it was all a lot of rumors and circumstantial evidence and suspicious. There wasn't felt to be enough evidence to charge anyone. So the verdict of the inquest was, we find that Mr. Charles Delaney Turner Bravo did not commit suicide, that he did not meet his death by misadventure, that he was willfully murdered by the administration of poison. And so this is a kind of interesting verdict where they rule out suicide or accidental death, but 
They then say there is not sufficient evidence to fix the guilt upon any person or persons. Florence and Jane Cox were free to go. But the second inquest was devastating to Florence. With the press in attendance, there was no way to keep news of her affair out of the papers. And you can see here, she was front page news. And the media conflated the guilt of her affair with the guilt of a murder. And the public ate up every salacious word. It was a sensation. The Saturday Review described it as one of the most disgusting public exhibitions which has been witnessed in this generation. The Evening Standard complained that she is a miserable woman who indulged in a disgraceful connection. And the Venerable Times wrote, she was an adulterist and an inebriate, selfish and self-willed, a bad daughter and a worse wife. She might never have been found guilty of the crime in a court of law, but in the court of public opinion, whether she killed him or not, she was a guilty woman and deserved public scorn. It was a devastating effect for her and her whole family. Her father actually became ill, devastated by the publicity. Uh, the family business went bankrupt and all of their property abroad had to be sold to pay debts. Gully's reputation was ruined as well. He didn't live much longer, dying with his widowed sisters, estranged from his only uh, daughter. Florence was made an absolute pariah. She was forced to move to South Sea on the coast where she drank herself to death and she died at the age of 33. But did she do it? There's another hypothesis to the crime that is in fact much closer to the original conclusions of suicide. This theory is that Charles Bravo had been slowly poisoning his wife with small cumulative doses of tartar emetic. It would help explain some of her chronic illnesses and miscarriages. He did it in order to inherit her fortune, according to this theory. And what happened was actually an accident, that he had taken it by mistake. He'd been treating himself with laudanum for toothache and he just switched the bottles. He took the wrong one. He then um, tried to cover his tracks and didn't do a very good job of it and accidentally died. This would go along a little bit with Mrs. Cox's first statement that he poisoned himself, and then she might have changed her statement to deflect suspicion from Florence. Or it's possible that Florence did do it to revenge herself on a bad husband. Or maybe it was Mrs. Cox looking out for her beloved quasi-daughter. Or maybe it was the groom, or maybe it was someone else altogether. We just don't know. There are some things we do know, though. At the time, her story was used as a moral lesson. You can see here a pamphlet that was sold telling of her story of dissipation, folly, and vice. Basically, don't do what Florence did, be a good wife, and your life will continue on the straight and narrow. But for us, I think the takeaways are a little more complex. The story of Florence Bravo is an illustration of the constraints that Victorian women labored under in unhappy marriages. For many women, marriage turned into little better than a prison sentence. Women were expected to endure no matter what, whether the marriage was abusive, constant pregnancies year after year. Even upper class women had little recourse. There's no battered women's shelters. Most Victorian fathers would have insisted like Florence that she make the best of it. It is possible that she actually accidentally poisoned Charles Bravo, another theory because antimony in small doses could be used surreptitiously to control alcoholics. Uh, if you took a very small amount of antimony and then you had alcohol, it would make you violently ill, but no ill effects. You would just throw up the alcohol and everything else. It could be she was worried about her husband's sexual advances. Another pregnancy could have killed her. And men at the time had sex, um, had the legal right to demand sex whenever they wanted. There was no such thing as marital rape at the time. So maybe she was trying to lightly poison him just to keep his advances at bay. Did she poison him by mistake? It's impossible to know. The flip side here is, though, her sex, all of those constraints that went along with being a woman, 
also is the reason that she likely was never charged for the murder. Because the police, the coroner, the lawyers, the jury, despite feeling that Florence was perhaps guilty, were reluctant to condemn an upper-class woman to the gallows or to long-term imprisonment. She just didn't look like a cold-blooded killer. You could learn a moral lesson from her, but they didn't quite have the stomach to go ahead and charge her. The other thing that comes out of it is but by betraying the trust and power that he had as a gentleman, there was an undercurrent that believed perhaps Bravo deserved his fate too. She got her just punishment in being shunned by the world, but there wasn't a lot of sympathy for Charles Bravo. He was also an example of a failed gender norm. He was not living up to his expectations. And the subtext here was, if he had been a better husband, maybe he wouldn't be dead now. So that is the story of the Balaam tragedy or the murder at the Priory, an unsolved mystery that, as you can see, was a great fascination to many at the time and continues to be now. So thank you all for joining us here with this webinar. And uh, I hope to hear from you again or see you again, maybe in person next time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much, Amy, for your lecture. It was wonderful. Uh, Amy has also provided some additional materials that you may wish to review following this lecture to further your learning. These materials have been provided on the course webpage. We know that learning has and will always be a social activity, so we encourage you to share this lecture with friends and family to discuss what you have learned today. If you'd like to learn more about the Laurie Association for Lifelong Learning, please visit wlu.ca slash L-A-L-L. -L. Thank you so much.